Gladdening the mind is an important part of meditation. It's listed as one of the steps in breath meditation. And the many places where the Buddha talks about how creating a sense of gladness, a sense of well-being, is an important prelude to getting the mind to settle down. He also talks about two ways in which you develop that sense of gladness. One is through getting the mind to be tranquil, calm. Talks about taking the breath, breathing in such a way that feels comfortable, and then spreading that sense of comfort throughout the body. Another way to glad the mind is through insight. He talks about what he calls renunciation gladness. We see that all the things in the senses, sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations, are inconstant and not worthy of attachment. And the fact that you're able to lift your mind above those things gives a sense of gladness. So when you find the meditation is down, feeling discouraged, think of ways to gladden the mind and have a broad repertoire for how you're going to do that. There's a passage where the Buddha is talking to Rahula, teaching him how to meditate. Before he talks about breath meditation, he gives him a series of other contemplations, contemplating the body in terms of elements or properties, contemplating the four Brahma Viharas, and contemplating the foulness of the body. We don't usually think of that as a way of gladdening the mind. Like the Buddha himself lists it as a painful practice. When you can think in ways that lift you above your ordinary obsessions with the body, that can give a sense of refreshment, a sense of expansiveness. Because you'll notice when you're focused on the body as being attractive, it usually focus on certain details. There are certain details that set you off. And you have to narrow your vision to a real narrow tunnel vision. Because things that you find so attractive are very near things that are not attractive at all. Just go down beneath the skin a little bit and there's a lot of stuff you wouldn't want to get anywhere near if the skin weren't there. But the fact that the skin is there makes a difference. Why is that? And you see that the practice of contemplating the foulness of the body is not so much to get down on the body. It's to learn how to understand your mind. Why is it that you can do this practice of going through the body section by section and organ by organ, each of the thirty-two parts? And you can admit that there's nothing attractive about any of them when they're taken alone. And then the mind switches, and all of a sudden they're attractive again. And we're a slave to that switch. So that's what you want to contemplate. All the contemplations ultimately get down to understanding perception. Only John's talking about contemplating feelings, especially feelings of pain. The issue comes down to what are the perceptions that create a bridge between the physical pain and the pain that you're suffering in the mind. That's a perception. What kind of perception? Why do you think in those terms? And the same with the contemplation of the parts of the body. The Buddha recommends that you start with your own body first, and then realize that the body that you're attracted to has pretty much the same parts. There may be a few details different here and there, but it's all pretty much the same stuff. Why do you let yourself get so attracted to that? Part of it, of course, is that you want to be, find yourself attractive. There's something that certain people, most of us, find exciting about thinking of ourselves as attractive. What's that all about? And that attractiveness then gets reflected back to us when we see other people's bodies. 
as being attractive. Why do we do this? What is it that the mind wants to accomplish? What's the allure? And how can you see through that? This is one of the things you can think about is how the parts that you're attracted to are very near parts that are not attractive at all. Why is it that you are able to draw such a clear, distinct, firm line? Because there's no such line in the body itself. So you want to see why you're doing this to yourself, and also how you don't have to. And the Buddha says you're not going to get past lust, you're not going to get past attraction to the body. Then you have non-return. So the issue is always going to be there. And it's interesting that non-return is also the point where you have perfected concentration. So when you can get the mind concentrated, focus on the breath, get some gladness out of the calm, and see if you can also get some gladness out of the insight that comes when you contemplate the things that have tied you down for who knows how long. As John Foreman pointed out, the things that we lust after, the things that we desire strongly in terms of the senses, are things that we had in the past, and we miss them. That's why we want them back again. He said, you think about that a little bit, and it's enough to give rise to a real sense of sanguega. Because if you get them again, you're going to lose them again, and they're going to lust after them again and miss them again. It's like that carrot that they used to get a donkey to move. They put it on a string, hang it from a stick, and it's just a little bit out of reach. So the donkey goes after it and keeps going and going. Of course, the carrot gets further and further away. And every now and then they'll give it a bite. And then they'll hang it out far away again. How much longer do you want to be in that position? It's when you can see through the attractiveness or why the mind wants to deceive itself around this. That's when the mind can get glad. Because there's a gladness that comes with freedom. That you don't need that anymore. You're not a slave to that anymore. So when the time comes to gladden the mind, have a pretty wide repertoire of things that you use to gladden it with. That way you can find a way of keeping the mind interested in the meditation, keeping it happy to be here, working on its internal problems. You have to remember, we're really fortunate that we have this opportunity. Look at the world outside. There's all kinds of disturbances going on, all kinds of conflict. And people don't have time to just stop and breathe. But as you're listening to this, you do have that opportunity. So make the most of it. Gladden the mind so that it can keep on going. Think of the Buddha's instructions to Rahula. When you realize that you've done something well, be gladdened by that, and then use that sense of gladness to further your practice. Get even more diligent. Now you use the gladness for something even better. One of the forest of Johns, who's reputed to be an Arahant, said that when he was able to get past his attraction to the human body, he was able to see the auras of people. So when you think thoughts of the unattractiveness of the body, don't think that you're cutting off an avenue to pleasure. You're opening up the mind to possibilities that you may not have thought of.
So even though it's listed as a painful practice, contemplation of the body can be gladdening. It's liberating. The gladness of liberation is one of the best forms of gladness there is.